Morning. So first up is Jack Black, who is a senior lecturer at Sheffield Hallam University and affiliated with the Centre for Culture, Media and Society, where he is research lead for the Anti-Racism Research Group, an interdisciplinary researcher working within psychoanalysis, media and cultural studies. Jack is the author of Race, Racism and Political Correctness in Comedy, Psychoanalytic Exploration, published by Routledge in 2021. His current research focuses on race, racism and psychosis, as well as online hate during international sporting events, for example, tackling online hate in football. Um, if, you, if this is the first panel that you attend in this conference, um, all, all papers at 20 minutes, and please save your questions um, for the end of the panel, where we'll be um, asking them all to, to the three speakers. So over to you, Jack. Thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, no worries. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully you can hear me. I'm just going to share my screen. So hopefully you'll be able to um, see the slides as well. Is that okay? Can everyone see them? Yep, we can see um, you, hear you and the slides. Fantastic. Okay, well, I'll crack on because I know obviously time's of the essence. So um, hello, everyone. Um, in this paper, I will be following the contention that one of the very reasons why we enjoy watching films stems primarily from an enjoyment that is obtained in experiencing the gaze on screen and specifically the disruptions that the gaze establishes for us, the spectators. Indeed, it is this contention that forms the basis of the Lacanian approach to film theory. Accordingly, while I will, over the course of this presentation, serve to elaborate upon Lacan's account of the gaze and its relation to film theory, it is in examples drawn from the horror genre that we can investigate the gaze in cinema, specifically in comparing Bernard Rose's 1992 Candyman with the recent Nia da Costa revival, I will consider how the tropes implied within the horror genre offer a novel account of the visual arrangements that work to develop our awareness of the gaze in film. In doing so, I will refer to how both the voice and the gaze are, are employed across both Candyman 92 and Candyman 21. So then, uh, we'll begin with uh, an understanding first of, of the gaze. So when considering accounts of the gaze, it is helpful to begin with early applications of Lacan's mirror stage in film theory. Notable here is Laura Mulvey's male gaze. In Mulvey's well-known study, she posits a subjectivization of the gaze on behalf of the spectator. That is, the filmic relation is one in which an all-seeing sense of mastery both constitutes and positions the watching spectator from a male heterosexual perspective. While Mulvey's work draws heavily from Lacan, it focuses primarily on his early seminars, neglecting Lacan's later work on the gaze and the real. Importantly, in his later seminars, uh, specifically Seminar 11, Lacan would come to redefine the gaze as that which disrupts the visual field, so that rather than helping to establish the subject, the gaze is what disturbs or unsettles the visual field. While well, this reconception of the gaze brings into contention wider discussions on the interpolated power of ideology in film, it also reveals how the gaze is not controlled by the subject. Notably, it is not the subject's gaze that is the focus, but the gaze which belongs to the object indeed that which the subject encounters from the object's point of view. This highlights how for Lacan, the gaze depicts a lack of mastery on behalf of the subject. This lack is often encountered through an absence which cannot be integrated into the subject's visual field, but which includes the subject in what is seen. What the gaze achieves, therefore, is a collapse in the subject's very distance towards the visual field, which is often experienced as a traumatic encounter. This trauma stems from the fact that the visual field is never a neutral space from which the subject looks upon. Instead, the object which the subject perceives also provides a position from which the subject can be looked at. This offers a unique approach to film analysis, redefining how the cinematic experience is not one in which the spectator is safely protected from the action on screen through some apparent distance. Instead, moments of disruption or even trauma work to undermine the sense of mastery and the safe distance that we supposedly achieve between ourselves and the screen. Indeed, in Seminar 11, Lacan expands upon his account of the gaze, linking it with what he comes to define as the objet petit art. For Lacan, the objet art is not a positive entity, but instead constitutes the gap within the subject's field of perception. Accordingly, whenever we perceive the world around us, there is always a gap within this field which denotes the subject. We can conceive of this gap as relating to the inscription of the subject's desire. What is key is that our desire can never be determined nor located in a specific object. If we do obtain the object of our desire, then it is the nature of desire to begin desiring something else. Thus, desire is that which forever distorts and shapes one's perception of the world. It, remain, it remains an absence for the subject. 
It is in the gaze, therefore, that we confront the effects of this absence, usually through a distortion in the filmic image that dissolves the distance between the spectator and the screen. Here, the investment of the spectator is brought to bear when the gaze becomes visible in certain figures or objects that make us aware of this very investment. For example, consider the well-known scene from Psycho where Norman Bates anxiously watches Marion's car, which contains her dead body, sink into the swamp. While slowly sinking, the car abruptly stops. Here, Slavoj Žižek notes, when the car stops sinking for a moment, the anxiety that automatically arises in the viewer, a token of his or her solidarity with Norman, suddenly reminds him or her that his or her desire is identical to Norman's, that his impartiality was always already false. At this moment, his or her gaze is de-idolized, its purity blemished by a pathological stain, and what comes forth is the desire that maintains it. The viewer is compelled to assume that the scene he witnesses is staged for his eyes, that his or her gaze was included in it from the very beginning. As evident in this example, in the case of film, it is the inscription of our desire in the filmic image that reveals how the spectator is not beholden to an omnipotent look. Instead, the spectator is involved in the filmic image through the disruption of the gaze, in this case, the disruption caused by the fact that the car abruptly stops sinking. Essentially, the car's sudden stop plays on the fact that we're all on the side of Norman. Importantly, this does not suggest that the effects of the gaze can be achieved by simply rendering our desire on screen. For example, if we consider pornography, then it is clear that the whole purpose of the porn film is to display an obscene enjoyment, that which remains hidden in our day-to-day -day experiences, but which in its on-screen depiction is vigorously displayed. Essentially, what the porn film seeks to display is the object art. It seeks to render that which is desired by the subject as an object on screen, a performance which, depending on your, your choice of genre, is delivered to the spectator by the copulating couple. It is for this reason that the pornographic film steers between tedium and eccentricity. Despite its rendering of desire, there is no absence within the pornographic image. Usually by the end of the film, everything has been shown on screen. What remains key to the object are, therefore, is that no object can ever constitute it. Consequently, when the gaze is encountered as an absence, this occurs through a distortion in the filmic image. Importantly, this distortion of the gaze means that there is no spectorial position which grants the subject a safe position, but that in accordance with Lacanian interpretations of the subject, the subject is marked by a sense of vulnerability. Now, when, when, I, read, when I read Lacan, one thing I sort of always, when I was thinking up, when I thought of the gaze was also always this scene from Alfred Hitchcock's Rear, uh, rear Window. For me, this sense of vulnerability is dramatically portrayed in Rear Window. While observing the courtyard outside his apartment, Jeff, played by James Stewart, encounters the burning cigarette in the apartment beyond. With the lights off, the sudden glow of the cigarette constitutes an encounter with the gaze. There is no mastery of this visual of this field on behalf of the spectator or Jeff. Instead, it is our very look which is already accounted for in the visual field. As a result, we confront a gap within our visual expectations. Where the horror genre proves notable is, is in its frequent use of both the gaze and the voice. In fact, in Seminar 11, Lacan relates the object art to a number of partial objects which the subject en encounters, including the breast, feces, phallus, as well as the gaze and the voice. And obviously it's the gaze and the voice that I'm interested in in this paper. In the case of the voice, this is usually represented in horror when we struggle to locate the origin of the voice. In contrast to the narrator or commentator who serves to direct our relation to what we view on screen, the ultimate example of the voice in film can be seen in Hitchcock's use of the mother's voice in Psycho. The nature of this voice means that it's difficult to pin down. Indeed, while the mother is murdered before the film begins, we never hear the mother speak in Psycho, and it is in, films, in, in the film's final scene that the voice's distortion proves dramatically unsettlingly when it is suddenly tied to Norman Bates. In effect, the voice does not find its proper home. Indeed, it is not embodied by the mother, but instead finds its embodiment in the wrong body. The distortion that this establishes works to disrupt the spectator's relation to the filmic image rendering clear its lack of control. In part, what the voice helps to achieve in horror is a depiction of the presence that lurks within the scene's diegetic absence. This is usually used in order to depict the presence of a hidden authority. The key here is that what this authority desires and determining who this authority is, is difficult to decipher. Their absence only compounds the presence of the voice and the difficulties in determining its location. For Bernard Rose, the location of the voice is frequently played with throughout Candyman 92. Here, the voice and its location in the mouth are often depicted as being separated. For example, in the car park, park, uh, the, the, sort of the car park scene, sorry, the garage scene, uh, if you're in the US, uh, where we first see Candyman on screen, 
For the majority of the scene, Candyman's face and mouth remain in darkness. I watched this scene again yesterday, and it's about two minutes, 20 seconds long. And for a good two minutes, 10 seconds, you never actually see the Candyman's face. You never actually see his mouth. Though we hear Candyman's voice, there is a separation maintained between the voice and its location. Elsewhere in the film, we see the bees leave Candyman's mouth, an image that further compounds the split between the voice and its location. These discontinuities between Candyman and the voice are foreshadowed at the beginning of the film when exploring Cabrini Green estate, Helen comes across a graffiti image of Candyman. Open wide, the mouth clearly denotes a scream or an outlet for the voice to be heard. Here we can ascribe the very failure of the voice and an image that serves to explicitly depict the voice. Indeed, through the gaping hole in the graffiti image, we can draw a connection to Edford Munch's scream and the silent scream that the painting emits. Accordingly, what is unique to both the Candyman graffiti and Munch's scream is that we hear the scream with our eyes. In comparison with Candyman 21, examples of the voice are never used. Um, so for some reason, the voice just never appears in, 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 the, in the recent revival. Instead for Da Costa, it is clear that a focus on the gaze takes precedent within the film with no explicit use of the voice being used to help establish Candyman's presence. Usually the gaze is depicted in the horror genre via the monster. Indeed, it's the presence of the monster's gaze that constantly watches the film's characters, as well as us, the audience. In fact, while Lacan notes that in my existence, as well as uh, in my existence, I am looked at from all sides, and later there is the gaze, that is to say, things that look, look at me. In Candyman 21, examples of the gaze occur frequently throughout the film. Moreover, in the case of Candyman, it is clear that he exists in the gaze, summoned in the mirrored reflections that allow him to cross through the mirror in order to murder his unfortunate victims. So serving as a point of contrast to Candyman 92, Candyman 21 relies upon the fact that for much of the film, Candyman is only partially revealed. As a result, the gaze is maintained over the course of the film by an absent presence that only ever reveals the Candyman through glimpses of the hook or other notable features associated with his attire. Indeed, this partiality is further conveyed when we are subject to the very first summoning of Candyman performed by Anthony. Despite Brianna's pleas, Anthony stares into the mirrored reflection of their apartment window and recites Candyman five times. Now, I couldn't get an image of this, but as we, no doubt we've probably all seen the film. Obviously, when they look away, there's the sort of reflection of Candyman that appears there in the mirror, in the window, sorry. Unbeknownst to Anthony and Brianna, it is at this point that the shadowy outline of Candyman appears to the audience in the reflection. Uh, Brianna and Anthony both don't see, the re see Candyman in the reflection. The appearance of Candyman further cements our investment in the screen, evident by the fact that our perception, indeed our very expectations and desire, are taken into consideration. Furthermore, beyond the mirrored examples where the gaze can be observed, instances of the gaze can also be found in several unique occurrences throughout the film. Early in the film, Anthony is stung by a bee while exploring the Cabrini Green housing project. Uh, or where the housing project once stood. Beginning as a small spot on Anthony's hand, the spot continues to get worse over the course of the film, with it eventually spreading across Anthony's arm. Much like Lady Macbeth and the well-known line, out damn spot, spots are often used to reveal the gaze, as well as the subject's anxiety that they are always being gazed at. Over the course of the film, the sting proves to be a point of anxiety for Anthony, one that traces his descent into madness at the clutches of Candyman. In another example, we can conceive of how the role of art and specifically painting is often used to help tame the gaze. For example, in expressionist painting, the artist seeks to activate the gaze through the artistic spectacle. And sort of lo and behold, with Anthony being an artist uh, towards sort of the sort of the last two thirds of the film, he tries to paint the sort of Candyman figure that he's sort of having having these these images of. Um, so in, I sort of in, in a certain way, he's trying to tame the gaze through these images. Importantly, I do not believe that these examples reflect attempts on behalf of Candyman to seize the power of the gaze, an interpretation predicated on the fact that the Candyman is a black man seeking retribution for his murder, as well as the murder of other black men. Rather, what the gaze encapsulates is the contradiction between power and its impotence. Whereas the gaze allows us to exert power over a particular situation, it also bears witness to our impotence, positioning us as passive witnesses to the gaze's observance. It is this sense of power and impotence that is played with throughout Candyman 21. As Key observes, Candyman is a representationally complex figure, both a terrifying monster and a pitiful victim of anti-Black violence. Candyman, along with both Helen and Anthony, seems to straddle the distinction between monster and victim. While for both Helen and Anthony, their position as victims is offset by the fact that they, much like Candyman, 
prey upon the, the greeny, green residents with each appropriating their experiences and stories for their research and their art. In much the same way, once summoned, Candyman is free to terrorize his victims, appearing as he does in numerous mirrored reflections. Yet it is his impotence that is emphasized when we remember that it's only through being summoned that his presence can be achieved. This impotence is effectively rendered in one notable scene in Candyman 21. Upon visiting the art critic's apartment, Anthony stands in front of a hallway mirror, whereupon he suddenly encounters a reflection of Candyman in the form of Sherman Fields, who we saw murdered by police at the start of the film. What is unique to the mirror is that the reflection of Sherman mimics Anthony's actions. In effect, Sherman, dressed as Candyman, is Anthony's reflection, with one notable difference included. Anthony's right hand now brandishes a hook in the place of Sherman's. While the scene plays upon themes of the uncanny, as well as the double and the doppelganger, it is in the replication of Anthony's movements that the Sherman reflection allows Anthony to perceive himself from the outside. Note, this is not a typical subject mirror reflection. The reflection Anthony perceives is not himself, but that of Sherman. In effect, while Anthony enacts his movements in front of the mirror, these movements are reflected back to him via the Sherman double. This poses a unique depiction of the gaze. Here, the objectification of Anthony's gaze is explicitly rendered in the copying of his movements so that Anthony can see himself, that is his own articulations, in the double. The objectification of Anthony's gaze in the double effectively means that Anthony becomes a spectacle to himself. Indeed, this scene offers an early insight into the, into the manipulations that Anthony will later undergo. It is also this relation between the gaze and the mirror which takes precedent in the film's end. So after witnessing the murder of Anthony by police, Rihanna is handcuffed and placed in an accompanying police car. Speaking to one of the police officers, she's given the choice of corroborating the police's story, which would resolve them of shooting Anthony, an unarmed black man. At this point, Brianna asks to look at the car's rearview mirror, where she recites Candyman five times. Depicted in these final scenes is what I believe can be conceived of as an ethical relation between the subject and the gaze. To summarize very briefly, Lacan's approach to ethics involves the subject rendering themselves open to the other or the gaze of the other. This can occur when the subject shuns the public world and commits themselves to the fantasy that exposes their own enjoyment. And here I draw upon Tom McGow Todd McGowan who elaborates, when one fantasizes, one exposes oneself to the other in the real. One invites the other to come too close and to see what usually remains unseen, the subject's private mode of enjoying itself. This kind of self-exposure involves directly embodying the gaze. It allows the other to both know and transform the subject at its most decisive point. It is, I believe, this ethical dimension which is played out in the final scenes of the film, implicating not just Brianna, but also us, the audience. As McGowan adds, when we encounter the gaze while caught up in a filmic fantasy, we find ourselves fully exposed on the screen, materialized in the form of the gaze. Indeed, I think this remains a unique attribute to DaCosta's film. In previous Candyman installments, and for much of Candyman 21, we are left in the exact position of not wanting to summon the Candyman. In fact, in many ways, Candyman 92 plays upon a sense of cynicism that I think belies the horror genre. This is apparent in the sense of distance or detachment that the horror film prescribes when we feel safe in the knowledge that we wouldn't stay in the haunted house, enter the basement, summon the poltergeist, or play with the, the, the possessed doll. Typically, you wouldn't catch me saying Candyman's name five times in a reflective surface. Yet in this final scene, such distance is eliminated. We are left in the position of acknowledging the gaze and thus fully exposing ourselves to the filmic fantasy. In this sense, the spectator's gaze is included in the scene, whereupon our desire, the appearance of Candyman, is fulfilled. To a certain extent, we are asked to transgress our previous inhibitions. What the film achieves, therefore, in this final scene is, I argue, nothing more than a reinvention of the Candyman franchise, and in particular, the logic that has sustained its continuation. It also speaks to the divisions within the law itself, and it is here that I believe the film's politics reside. Whereas forms of perversion require that one breaks the law through an act of transgression that serves to uphold the law, what Candyman 21 exposes is the effects of this perversion upon the law itself. As an authority of the law, it is the failures of the police who are left in the position of needing to hide and ultimately lie about the murder they have just committed. Such a perversion of the law is portrayed by the fact that it is the police, as the embodiment of the law, that requires Brianna to lie about Anthony's murder. What Brianna's relation to the gaze exposes, therefore, is the failure of this law, that is, its inherent lack. In effect, what the gaze exposes in this final scene is the inconsistency of the law and the perversion, 
breaking the law in the name of the law that it ultimately relies upon. It is in exposing this inconsistency within the law that the film follows a political gesture that remains appropriate to the gaze. Accordingly, while we can reflect upon the political contradictions that the film wishes to highlight with its ties to the Black Lives Matter movement and police corruption proving notable examples, what I wish to draw attention to is the extent to which these contradictions are not simply portrayed within the film as part of its filmic content, but that they occupy an integral part of its form. This is evidence in the use of the gaze and how the gaze occupies a formal component in the film. Whereas we are throughout the film encouraged to follow the secret behind the curtain, the partial indicators that convey the candy man's presence, in this final scene it is our complicity in the film's end that is expressed as we move from merely a neutral observer to a return of the gaze that's conjunctive with our own desire. Consequently, what Candyman 21 achieves is an identification with the gaze, a political gesture which is missing in Rose's original. This political gesture is achieved through the very way in which the film confronts the gaze in its final scene and how this confrontation implicates us, the spectator, in this relation. To this end, the gaze is not presented as a distortion which can be overcome or ignored, but is instead used to draw out the inherent imbalances and contradictions within the law itself. Theoretically, I believe this makes a step beyond simply analysing the content of the horror film towards its formal components, as well as the subsequent effect it can have on both the character and us, the horror spectator. Okay, thank you very much. I think I'll, I'll leave it there.